That's some funky music. Hi, my name's Steve Ferroni, or Ferrone. Some people call me Ferrone, Ferrone Ferroni. And uh, welcome to Gretsch Generations. And uh, I, if this is your first time here, uh, what they usually do is they put an old drummer and a young drummer together. And guess what I got? I got the old drummer. So <laughs> here I am. And uh, 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 let me see. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to introduce to you uh, uh, a young man that I just recently had the pleasure of meeting. He's a uh, uh, his band is like four times nominated for for uh, for Grammys. It's incredible. And if a band is as good as his drummer, this probably is a very, very good drummer. <laughs> okay, I want to introduce you to Jason McGurr. Oh, what? McGurr. Oh, McGurr. <laughs> What's up, Ferroni, Ferrone? Well, you know, I tell you, I was looking at some of these other ones that were on, that, that preceded us, and uh, this is going to be the best one. That's, uh, no, doubt, that, no doubt about it. You mean this one will have the best chance of legal action? Exactly. Fact, right? That's what you mean by the best one? <laughs> exactly. If I remember rightly, I have to press this little thing here to get a full screen. Ah, there you go. Oh, yeah, we could do that, can't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, talk, you taught me how to do that. Technology? Yeah. The interweb? <laughs> all right, so now I have a little script. I got everything, all kinds of stuff printed out, you know, because I, I, I'm, I'm not very, very... Uh, uh, I got to say, you know, that I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you because you you helped put me through this stuff, Andrew. Uh, Andrew, I don't understand a word he says. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> for for those of you who don't know who Andrew is, he is the uh, Gretsch artist rep. Um, been around a long time. He's a friend of ours. Uh, we want to thank Andrew. We also want to thank Jules Thomas before this whole thing gets off the rails and they just straight up cut us off. So. Jules at DW and, and Andrew Shreve at uh, Gretsch. Thank you very much for having. Yeah, well, us. you know, she's the she's the education and events manager. So this is all her fault. It's, uh, it's people yeah. are supposed to learn something. I don't know if this is educational or an event. Define <laughs> education. I mean, um, I don't know. I didn't do too much of it. I did a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Just enough to know what to do wrong, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right amount of wrong. So, so what do we do here? Now I've got to move forward. Oh, yeah. First impressions. Okay. Jason, it says here that you discuss your first impressions of me. Jeez. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no. You know what? When I found out about you, <laughs> I ran. No. I actually, I ran to the speakers is what I did. Um, you, um, you introduced me to the idea of funk and great feeling drumming with... Uh, Cut the cake. Uh, your Soul Train yeah. performance in 1977. I was only three years old, but I figured out how to use the remote, and wham. No, it, it was way after 1977 that I actually picked up on who you were and what you were doing. But there was no doubt in my mind that you took drumming somewhere physically that I had never considered. Um, I was definitely a fan of, of, you know, early on, whatever was on the radio, pop radio, which I didn't, you know what? I was probably Shaka Khan was the first time I heard you, and I didn't realize it. Um, yeah. And we'll get into that. But once I started really investigating drumming, who was drumming, you know, uh, looking for records or cassette tapes at the time. My grandparents gave me a Buddy Rich and a Gene Krupa cassette tape. I remember those. I had never, yeah, <laughs> time check. Did you have time check? Do you remember that, <laughs> Buddy Rich? Anyway, I had never heard drumming like that. And then, you know, it segued into machine gun fire, snare drum playing into more uh, groove stuff. And, you know, Zeppelin was in there. But when I heard... When I heard the average white band, and then when I started to see some videos, um, even before I discovered a lot of other soul and R and B, um, you really, really set the bar for me. And that performance, specifically that 1977 Soul Train with your white Gretsch with the black band in the middle of the kit. I hope mm -hmm. maybe we'll have a picture of it later on. But um, was it a stop sign badge kit? Do you yes, remember? Yes, I, I believe it was. Yeah, I believe it was a stop sign. Kit. Well, there it is. You were so, there it is. Look yeah. at that, man. Your commitment to the groove and the backbeat and your placement and your intent, your intention was so heavy and you, you just floated. The groove just floated and everybody seemed to be looking to you. That's it. That's all I got for you. I think this session's over. Okay, thank you. No. It's been really nice talking to everybody. 
<laughs> no, I, you know, it's funny because uh, I, I did, I did, I guess I did exactly the same. I didn't just start being a groove drummer. I mean, I, I, I started watching, you know, Buddy Rich. You know, I mean, I, I used to, I used to listen to bands more than I did to drummers. And uh, I mean, Rolling Stones and the Beatles figured heavily in my in my. Uh, you know, I love those songs. You know, I'm, I'm sort of a song guy myself. But, but of course, uh, as a young a young upcoming drummer, I wanted to be drum do drum solos all over the place, and uh, you know, wanted to play as much stuff as I could. And I got to playing with these older guys who said, mm. <laughs> <laughs> "You need to stop that." Yeah, no, <laughs> no. And they well, made made me listen to. They made me listen. To, to Chicago more than Earth, Wind and & Fire. And and uh, and uh, and, uh, uh, and they said, no, this is the way to go, really, you know. And they had this guitarist, a uh, French guitarist uh, named, named uh, Jean-Claude Chanavar, and he was about five foot tall, little guy. But he used to play football. He used to, uh, football, our uh, football, like European football. Sure. The, the original football. Not American football, real football. No, none of that <laughs> silly stuff. And uh, and no he, he used to play like five or six games, five or six games a week, and he, and he, he had legs, big legs, you know, big, you know, he's really into football, still is. You know. This was the and, guitar player. Yeah, yeah. Guitar and player he, is supposed to have skinny legs. No, this one he had. He's, okay. He was short, about five foot, you know, really low, you know, with the low center of gravity. These guys like real football, built like a football player. He had these big, big legs, and he'd sit there and. He, tap his foot, you know, and if I started to speed up or something, he'd kick me. <laughs> he kicked, and big, big leg kick coming at you? I don't know if you, I don't know if you've ever been kicked by a football player. Um, No, no, you, yeah, like yeah. in other words, someone that's used to kicking, right? That's what yeah, I mean, it doesn't look like much. It's kind of effortless. <laughs> but but that little <laughs> foot would come out, bang, he kicked me in the leg. Like, is this, this is if you were rushing? Or if you weren't like, yeah, if I, or like... yeah, if I was, if I was like, if I was, if I was thinking about me and not the band, or just mm. like just like speeding up, or you know, just playing some stuff that was just sort of like overly excited, the the exuberance of youth, I call it. So, uh, yeah, not it, to cut you off, was that you know, I don't know if anybody reprimanded me for doing the wrong thing early on, but I, I kind of wish they had because I feel like I, I probably would have landed in. a successful band a lot sooner than trying to still mess around with playing well, yeah. all around the kit but it's very evident that you um you have been listening to songs and playing four songs for a long time well i'd, I'd listen to i started tap dancing when i was a little kid so that was a, that was my education of songs and dynamic within the song rhythmically syncopation so i i i could pick up pick up a song very quickly and like I say, I, I never really listened to drummers per se. I'd listen more to to the song. I, I'd like the songs. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And and that's how you paved your career. Obviously, I I will never forget. Uh, I was teaching in a music school in Seattle, Seattle Drum School, and uh, I auditioned for um, Death Cab for Cutie, who I've been <laughs> with for twenty years now, and I had charted out everything. Like I had, I had written down all of the drum parts for um, their catalog at the time, and we knew each other, and it was going to be, uh, you know, it was an audition, but it was like let's just get together and play. It wasn't as much like them auditioning a bunch of of musicians. Anyway, long story short, about three songs in of me looking over my shoulder and at the music stand and reading, they were like, okay, you you obviously know the the music, like you can play the parts, but let's put the music away and just mm. listen. Let's just play as a band. And uh, I remember that being a very black and white moment, in, you know, in my career where I was like, all right, use your ears, don't use your eyes. Like time to pay attention to everyone in the room more mm. than yourself, more than what your limbs are doing. Listen to other people, listen to the band. Yeah, I mean, mm. I, I suppose the on the flip side, I could have gotten kicked and <laughs> I would have figured it out that way too, but it's it's very true. And I mean, you, um, your your path and your catalog, your history, your discography. I am so honored to be speaking with you because you are who who I want to be, who I've always strived to be, is someone that is a major part of the band and the song and what's coming across to the ears of the listeners. Not as much. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fascinated by you know technical virtuosos and people that can play 
amazing things on the drum set. Um, I really admire that amount of um, time and practice and technical prowess. But for me, I want to reach as many people as possible. And I think that you've done that specifically mm. well. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I, thank tell, you. Me about, tell me a little about Average White Band and how that got started. Well, uh, was well it, uh, is this uh, how you got kicked? Was that the start? Well, yeah, that was <laughs> that was kind of the that was kind of the start of it. Uh, uh, the the band that I would this band that I was talking about was a band called the Piranhas, and the guy who was in the band before me was Robbie McIntosh. He was the drummer, the the drummer from uh, Average White Band, the original drummer. I remember. Uh, Robbie and I were friends. We'd been friends since I was about. Uh, I think I think we spent my seventeenth birthday together in, uh, well maybe seventeenth or eighteenth birthday it was in Rome, in Italy. I'd uh, I'd gone to Italy uh, uh, to for a week, uh, and you know uh, I ended up staying for for a year because it was warm. <laughs> well, for more than a year, I stayed for three years in in Italy, and uh, and. Uh, uh, Robbie used to play in a band called the Senate, and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, then he left and 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 started working with the Piranhas, and then when he left the Piranhas and uh, and uh, a guy uh, there was a French drummer used to play with them, a guy called Andre Sicarelli. Did you ever hear him? Hear of him? Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Andre's bad. Andre's badass. Andre, Andre's badass. So Andre was a was the drummer before him, and then he went in there. Uh, and he he worked with with them, and then he went on to play with Brian Auger, and I follow I kind of followed him around. I mean, it's like when he when he left the, the I went into the Piranhas, and and Robbie was a great groove, groove drummer too. He really was a good groove drummer. So then I followed him into into that. Then I got a call like uh, six six years later. I got this call. I was li living in France, and I'd gone to school to learn learn about music because I. I didn't know how to read. I was. I started off just being like a band, band drummer, just like learn the songs and then just play. But I knew working with these guys in France that I had to, um, I had to, I had to. If I if I wanted to be a professional musician, then I had to, I had to learn the craft of my trade, and that was I had to learn how to read, follow a chart at least, and uh, and um, and uh, and so I did that. And then I started playing with Brian Auger. Uh, and then through playing with Brian Auger, I started to do sessions. And um, the first uh, the first session that I did as a studio musician was with Freddie King. It's an album called Burglar. And there, <clears throat> and there was this producer called Mike Vernon. Uh, he came to see the band to play at Ronnie Scott's, and he said, "I've got to have this band play on this album." And then uh, and then I went and did that. And then he started to produce a band called Bloodstone. Who had that uh, natural high? It's an R and B band here in Los Angeles, and then I came here, and and Average White Band were here, and uh, I started to hang out with Robbie because he was an old friend, he was my buddy, and um, he he called me up. He said, "Listen, we, they were playing at the Troubadour." He said, "When he said the last night, can you come to the last night at the Troubadour? It's going to be a party. Let's go and party." You know, me and Robbie used to drink a lot together. Back in the day, Robbie was one of the greatest drinkers that I ever met. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we'll save that and, for another whole another session. <laughs> right, right. But uh, I couldn't, um, I couldn't go uh, to that party because I was working on this movie with Bloodstone. They were doing this movie, and uh, Robbie, Robbie passed at that party. He, he took some drugs and and he OD'd at that party. And so I went around to see the guys. I was friend. I became friendly with Hamish and, uh, and the other guys in Average White Band. And uh, I went around and saw them, and they just started to get airplay. So I said, "Look, I said, you know, you, you can't sort of stop now. Robbie wouldn't want you to stop for this stuff." I said, "If there's anything I can do to help you until you find another drummer, I'll do it." So what happened was, Stix Hooper from uh, the Crusaders and myself. If I couldn't do it, Sticks would do the gig, and then uh, you know, uh, and I started doing these these gigs. Uh, we started off opening for Billy Cobham, <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, because of the the hit record, pick up the pieces with a big hit yeah. record. Yeah, uh, uh, they, we started headlining the headline switch. The headliner switched, 
Uh, so I was, I was playing this gig with them down at Long Beach, at Long Beach Arena. Uh, and, uh, and it was great gig. We had this great gig. And, uh, and I came off the stage and this little guy walked up to me. And, uh, and he, he had a really sort of one of those sort of, uh, he said, you got to be in the band. You got to join the band. And I said, well, I, I said, I, I'd love to, but I can't. I'm, I'm under contract to, to this band, Bloodstone. And, uh, and uh, 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 you know, I'm under contract to them for a year. They, they contracted me to, 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 to do the movie and do some tour gigs and stuff. And he said, you're out of that contract and you're playing in this band. And I thought, who the hell is this guy? He's a little dapper guy. He had like a little goatee, you know, very smart, nice suit and, you know, sports jacket and stuff. You know. And I said to, to the manager, Bruce McCaskill, I said, who's that guy? You know, who's that guy? He said, oh, that's Ahmed Erdogan, chairman oh. of Atlantic Records. He said, I believe it's your, your record label, your band's uh, record label too. I have a Shepherd Fairy uh, portrait of Ahmed. Right yeah, yeah, there on the wall. Well, maybe, maybe I'll zoom, put the camera up there in a little bit. But yeah, amazing. When you started describing the suit and the little short guy, <laughs> all put together, yeah, that's funny. Yeah, Atlantic Records, uh, made by Ahmet Erdogan, without a doubt. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and it really was a family back then. I don't know what I it's bet. like now. You probably got more experience with them now. We're with I Atlantic mean, Records now, but it's not. I, you know, you 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 were part of a time when it was. It was the holy grail of all record labels. I well, think. you know, there's Jerry they're Green. They're still amazing, but it's just a, it was a different culture and climate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, Jerry, Jerry Greenberg was the president of, of Atlantic at that point. There. And, you know, I'm still in touch with him and, and, and a lot of the old um, the people from Atlantic. Um, they, sorry to cut you off. I, we could talk about Atlantic Records because we have this kind of thing in common. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of the music business we could talk about, but... Um, we are being directed by our director to do a segue into some studio stories. So, um, since you did... Where are you seeing that? I'm not seeing that. <laughs> oh, you're not. You know what? Um, if you shrink your screen, go back down to the not full screen version, or oh, I'm more than happy to let you know. So, so people would like to know, the world would like to know your favorite studio track. So, this could be a segue into the first session you did for Atlantic Records, or it could be um, average white band. It could be something Petty did. Uh, I already know what my favorite studio story is. If you want me to s start, I'll, I'm happy to start. Well, otherwise. yeah, yeah, because I, I got some questions about your you studio. Can, you can you can think about it. I'm gonna tell my favorite studio um, story, which is which pertains to you actually. Um, uh, I recorded with my band Death Cab at a very famous studio called Sound City. And you know the place I'm talking about because you yeah, got wildflowers, wildflowers yeah. there with Tom Petty. And I walked into that room and I just said to the engineer, where did Steve set up? And he was like, excuse me? And I said, where did Steve Farone set up his drum set? And he pointed to a microphone on the ceiling. Does this sound about right? At 57 hanging from the ceiling? Um, don't I don't remember. <laughs> don't remember. <laughs> anyway, um, I would have paid mean, more attention if I'd have known it was going to last so long, all this stuff. No, 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 no. <laughs> That's all right. It was uh, Sound City is a famous room. Uh, Wildflowers was made there. One of my top five records of all time. Uh, top five favorite albums. Um, Nirvana was recorded. It recorded um, uh, Nevermind there. Uh, Queens of the Stone Age. Um, Elton John. Uh, Rick Springfield. Um, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. There's a great documentary yeah. for anyone who's interested um, about Sound City. Uh, Dave Grohl put together. But uh, as soon as I got in that room. And I set up, and I played the drums. I heard you. I heard Grohl. I heard everyone amazing that had ever been in that room uh, because the drum sound was was so recognizable. And I feel like I tracked a better record there. I've actually been there maybe three, three or four times for three different albums. Um, some single work. Uh, uh, I, I tracked most of a Tegan and Sarah record there, but it is without a doubt one of my favorite rooms across the globe. And uh, that old console, that need that was in there, that is no longer in there, um, is um, Grohl bought that, didn't he? Uh, Grohl bought that, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like hurting. I, he probably did put some work into it. That's what the documentary is about. It's really good. But anyway, it's um. That room and that studio was probably the first studio that I ever walked into that I recognized 
albums, you know, that I played the drums and I heard the tonality, the way my snare drum felt. It was as if I was a kid listening to the records again that I grew up on. So yeah, it's a great uh, room. I yeah, like that. Room. I mean, th that um, that is one of my favorite um studio experiences. I mean, there's several stories. I'm sure for you, it's going to be hard to define <laughs> one. I mean, there's funny stories. There's you know emotional stories there's success stories there's tragic stories we, i know that you and i both have studio tragedy stories like the ones that you go into and then you pack up and leave the same day because they're such shitholes but anyway yeah you laugh this is real life um <laughs> what we have to do today is both you and i are sitting in studios obviously so we're, we're carving out new studios at home because this is kind of the way we have to work these days but anyway i want to know something that stands out in your mind is a, is a great you know, studio story or track, you know, moment? Well, I mean, I've been really blessed with a lot of tracks and a lot of studios. I mean, uh, uh, my favorite, favorite all-time studios, Power Station in New York mm. um, uh, um, and uh, 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 um, Abbey Road. Uh, 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 God, uh, uh, right, right Track Studio was a great one to play in. It's not there anymore. I don't was think. was there for for me for Sound City? Uh, there was a song. It was a big single for us called "You Are a Tourist," and that yeah. drum sound is all about that room. Is there a song you can think of? Uh, be it Sound City with Petty, or I mean, well, the I mean, Petty, the Petty experience at Sound City. We cut a lot of songs in there in two weeks. Really, I mean, it was like one week and then a, a long break, and then we did went back and did another week. Yeah, uh, uh, you don't know how it feels. Was, oh, that's was that was the track yeah that was the first track that i cut and uh, and you know rick rick rubin <laughs> rick rubin didn't like the sound of the symbols in the room what because we had who's we this had, guy rick rubin uh, no he had, seriously he had, we had all the these ceiling room is mics. super high. the ceiling is like 30 feet high what was the yeah, problem yeah but they they had all these room mics out and and uh, and and it just it, whenever i hear a crash symbol it just went <laughs> and he didn't like this so he said this a what can we do about that? And I said, well, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll play it without using any crashes and I'll overdub it. And, uh, and so you we doubled? did that. You don't know how it feels? No, uh, well, I was going to, I was going to put crashes on it. Right. I, I thought, and then this is about take two or three, or maybe two. I mean, so we did a run good. through and, 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 uh, and then, uh, he came in and he said, "Oh, we've got it under control now. You can just play normally." So we played. We, we went spent all day on that. And when the when the when the uh, track came out, a friend of mine called me up from uh, Nashville and said, "Is that you playing on that Tom Petty single?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "Driving me crazy. Been waiting all day for a crash symbol, and there's like nothing. There's no. Why don't you hit any crashes?" <laughs> I, I'm with. I'm with you. No, I. So I look nothing but love for Zildjian symbols, but there are plenty of times, especially in recording environments, where a crash symbol ruins it. I I don't know. I I can't explain it any other way. Your discipline, your discipline. So good for that track, and I can hear the compression on those mics lifting, like when your hi hat in between the kick and snare, where the the, the sound dissipates and that hi hat kind of lifts up. And I can also yeah. see physically your body, like giving this lope to the pattern, as simple yeah. as it is. But if it's you played a, if you played a crash, we probably wouldn't be talking. I mean, Gretch would have Gretch would have reached out to me and said, "There's this guy steep." No, 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 the guy plays crashes. <laughs> <laughs> guy plays crashes i don't need that no there's a time and a place right so you you uh you get asked to do all kinds of things in the studio so i have a question for you about that specifically because i'm i'm, do, I'm doing a lot of session work at home mm. and people are wanting to hear a lot of you know when they discover you have options right well i could do it this way i could do it that way um uh like for instance steve gad up close that that video or in se it was actually in session the, the the one he did with will lee which who i would love to talk about because i know you've tracked with will as well yeah but that's... what do you do in a studio situation where you're sitting with a producer an artist you really respect and you want to be there and you want to be tracking uh but they're asking for 
more and more options and more and more revisions and you get to a point where you don't necessarily believe that those options are making the song any better do you ever find I, yourself in that situation i did i did a session once where this guy kept there was he wanted a fill in this because you know i just played the song like a, and there was a there was a there was like a break one doing da doing da and he said okay uh, play a uh, rather dumb so we punched it in rather played the no 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 Play digga digga da da. He was going through all this stuff, and I said, "I got, I got, I got the perfect, I got the perfect fill for you." I said, "This is a, this is a secret. This is like, this is the fill. <laughs> Trust me, this is something special." No. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Just a backbeat. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, sometimes people seem to over. I mean, I've done sessions with some people that they want more fills. They want this fill, this fill, 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 fill. And I'm like, what? You know, the, the song's kind of speaking as it is, really. Yeah. You know? I, I, I find that I worked. You can always say no. <laughs> <laughs> True. I'm going to exercise no. For, I think yeah, I'm going to start no's, exercising no's good. no. No, no's good. Um, I, uh, you know what? Uh, there's so many stories we could talk about. Like, I want to actually move into. We're talking about studio, but you ob obviously, sp obviously spent a fair amount of time on the road, and largely the last twenty-five years were with Petty. Am I right yeah. in terms of that that time frame? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the last time I saw you with Petty was unfortunately quite a while ago. I want to say it was like six, seven years ago. Bonnaroo. Does that sound right? Is that when Penny Petty played Bonnaroo last? Was that Where's Bonnaroo? Where is that? Nashville? In Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, outside Nashville. In the woods, yeah, middle of the big woods. Fest, big festival. It was, I think it was the same night I heard of the day after. Like, you you played. We were playing on... Death Cab was on another stage. We ran over. Ran, which was the equivalent of, like, two miles in the woods. You know, because we didn't get a, <laughs> couldn't get a golf car. Snakes and for, crocodiles and stuff. Yeah, right? Uh, I mean... Anyway, it, you guys owned the stage. There wasn't a single song that came across the PA that people didn't know, that everyone of all ages knew. And we, we just, we've had so much respect for the band and, you know. Well, we had quite a catalog to work with with that band. Yeah, we had a pretty good songwriter. <laughs> yeah, the guy the guy did fine. Um, we could have I, done a show with the songs we didn't play and everybody yeah. would have been happy. Yeah. Such a tragic, tragic loss. I'm sorry, yes. Steve. Yeah. Um, well, did you have, can you specifically picking from the petty pool of stories can you think of a good tour story uh, a live a road thing some favorite moment was it a, a venue or a festival or something well, the, 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 i think you know it talks about mistakes there was one one mistake <laughs> one, thing, one, one mistake in particular that happened that was that was a pretty good one <laughs> we played in chicago wherever it was in that stadium with the Bulls players, yeah. United Center or United something like Center, that. United Center, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so, I don't know, what's that, 25, 30,000 people, something like that? I think know? it's 25,000 people. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 uh, and, I, and I'm sitting up there and, uh, and, and uh, we play we're in the middle of the set and the heat of this thing. And, you know, and I glanced down at my set list and I misread the set list. Right? Oh, I've, I've never done I've, that. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. I've never, <laughs> I've never started the wrong song in a big venue. Well, you know, if you're oh, if you're being a drummer and having to be aware of what's going on on stage, I look down and I and and I and I <laughs> get the tempo for the next song ready for it, and it's just happening. And 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 I notice that the band are looking at me like, <laughs> you know, and and I, and I count off the song, and and everybody's like really looking at me like. What the hell is he doing? <laughs> so I'm I'm just about to get started playing, and I looked down at the set list, and it was like, oh! And it was too late. I hit the tip, hit the drums. I I sort of started, and I just and and everybody, the whole place just burst into laughter, and I and I and I just you know, sort of went into my fault. You know, Petty turned around and he said, "Oh, Steve just swallowed a fly." <laughs> Boy, he said that on the mic. <laughs> You made up an excuse for me. It was fantastic. Amazing. Well, it's nice. It's nice when your when your bandmates can, you know, have a little bit of humor about that situation. Obviously, there are times when the the pressure is a little, a little higher. Uh, I couldn't I've, get I've a, had... I couldn't get a girl to kiss me for months after that. Oh, right. Look, as a 
as as someone that still would go to see shows, it's been a while since I've seen a show, right? <laughs> Both of us. But as someone that would still go, being a fan of bands and watch shows, I kind of waited for the moments that weren't perfect. I mm. wasn't. I, I I would look for that um, when there was a little bit of human error in the equation. I I love that today's technology allows you to. I bet I, I guess you're bored. You know, there's artist, entertainer, musician, computer guy, whatever. Like you can hit a space bar and walk away, and and your show can happen. But for me, the those times when it's coming off the rails, when shit is just really going wrong, and your your bandmates are standing up there like profusely sweating because they just feel like they are phoning it in or like not giving the performance of a lifetime for these you know for these fans out front i i see that happening on stages and it escalates the whole experience for me i really like that sort of sense of danger i like when there's a little bit of you know about to come off the rails i mean i don't like it as much when i'm on stage because i've started the wrong song too and had and had you know the singer of death cab turn around and look at me and just go oh you get the look yeah, or, you know, <laughs> wait for me to figure it out, and then I'm like, got it, got it, got it. Um, but again, it's there's a lot going on. We're, we're, you know, we're stimulated in so many ways, and who knows what the monitor mix is is, is doing. I mean, I had a, um, I, uh, I'm trying to think of my worst oops moment. You know what, I since you gave an oops moment, we, do, we, we are being asked for oops moment. I actually want to give a, a, um, a great moment. Um, which you should give a great moment as well. Um, I Death Cab uh, was asked to um, play a festival in Kent, England, with the Foo Fighters, and um, I know you're gonna you're gonna make a bigger story out of this because you play in front of huge crowds. But there were sixty five thousand people out in front of the stage, and you know, PA's mid crowd level, and I mean, the people just disappeared. Like you you stop seeing faces. It was so deep. Uh, wrapped around as far as you could see and I remember it going by so fast being terrified and like my drums felt like I was hitting air I mean there was still like power in the event but it was it was one of those moments where I felt like this is the biggest crowd I will ever play in front of and it I, it, it might have been I mean there's some, some big festivals but that was for me a, a major tour highlight yeah you like that there's nothing like it is it oh it's it's amazing uh but I you know, I also like a club show. You know, I, I I would rather be up close to somebody that I, you know, well, there's that, American, I, that there's, I spent there's, 20 there's, years there's, with playing music and, you know, cramped in a corner. Like there's there's excitement well, in that as well. There's merit in both scenes, but, you know, there's right. nothing like, there's nothing, for me, there's nothing like walking out on stage in front of a gigantic audience and feeling that love that comes toward yeah. you as soon as you walk out on the stage and you haven't even played a note yet. <laughs> I don't think that yeah. when we do get to go back out and tour in front of uh, a larger audience again, I can't imagine anyone's going to have anything to complain about. You know, no. it's been well catering. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how much do you want to pull back the curtain for folks here about what really goes on on the road? The importance of good catering is paramount. Clearly, yeah. yeah I mean. Uh, you know, I, 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 it's funny. People ask me about road stories with the Heartbreakers, and outside of outside of the gigs, that we don't really socialise that much. You know, I go and do my thing in where, whatever city we were staying in, and everybody else does their thing. Maybe I meet up with Scott or Ron and uh, and, and go and have a cup of coffee or Benmont. You know, but yeah. but uh, but um, you know, basically, we were all sort of on our. The, the big thing with the Heartbreakers was if we had a day out somewhere was to go find a music store that had old instruments. Of course. And uh, and go and buy old instruments, buy up stuff. Hellstone? I don't, we went to a place upstate New York, I think it was in Buffalo once, and we walked in this gigantic store. And, these, of course, all the salesmen came up and started, like, thrusting, like, new guitars in front of in front of Tom and Mike, and they were, they you know, and they had this look. Tom, Tom was with you. He would. Tom would go with you. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Would you guys call ahead and say, "Look, uh, we're going to need the shop open, even if you're closed." Or no, no. We just show up. Just show up. Yeah, yeah. right. That's the and, best way. Unannounced. And, and then, and then I said to this. I remember saying to this guy, I said, "Listen, 
do you have a room where you have that's full of stuff that nobody wants? You <laughs> always said, gotta ask. <laughs> he said, Well, we got a room like that. So he took us up in this thing and he opened this door and it's all this dust came out. And uh, we found this treasure trove of stuff. He, we, f- we found a, a Ludwig and Ludwig snare drum, uh, a drum kit, complete complete drum kit. And 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 Mike said, "Well, do you want it?" And I said, "No, nah, I got plenty of old drum kit." And he, he he and Mike bought it. He still has it. It's really old, amazing uh, calfskin heads and everything on it. It's really old. Thing. Yeah, I mean, it. We had the benefit of as touring musicians, like early on before eBay inflated prices and you know before craigslist i mean craigslist did help but there was a time when i was on tour where my tour manager was just every time i'd walk up to him and i didn't have a show related you know if he saw me walking down the hall he'd be like we don't have any more truck space jason we don't have any more truck space because i was buying kits in every back room drum shop that we would go to because you got your tour itinerary, you got your schedule. And for me, I would go down the list. I'd be like, all right, I got revival drum shop on Saturday. I got Nelson drum shop. How do you on think Tuesday. I feel? How do it you was think ridiculous I feel? I was, because I, I was, was, I was, yeah. I was around in the sixties. I, I was yeah. playing in this. That's, that's, that stuff was all over the place in the sixties. If Not I'd fair. have known and what I know now, I would have <laughs> I made an investment. I didn't even, I'd look at drum kits and go, well, I can't afford that. I was like, I, I, I you know, they they. I used to ask around what was the, what was the best drum kit, and they and everybody told me, "Oh, Gretsch is the best drum kit." I couldn't even afford one of those. It was like I couldn't even get anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> speaking of Gretsch is the best drum kit, I do believe that is the case. But I have a quick question. You had a pearl problem for a while. I'm just wondering what happened there, because no, you were, I, I, you were playing I, Gretsch, and all of a sudden you you like. Well, that was uh, that was, I heard I heard some guys talking on one of these shows before, and they were astonished that Jeff Picaro, oh, Jeff right. Picaro was uh, was playing, and he used to record with with Gretsch. Well, I had the same problem. Uh, the the problem I had was that uh, Gretsch, when I first started with Gretsch, they were with Baldwin Baldwin Distributor, and then they went to some other company, and they basically offered me a shitty deal. Yeah, you know? and uh, and and. Uh, uh, I, I, I went and saw, I came out here to Los Angeles and I went and saw Jeff and I said, well, you know, what should I do? And he hooked me up with Paul and Paul I just, was just fantastic. And they make decent drums, you know, uh, 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 and they, they were just fantastic at supplying kits. So I was traveling a lot, working all over the world, all over the planet. And, and, and they would just have a drum kit wherever I wanted. The great, the Gretsch deal at that time was, you know, wherever you went, you have to, you had to take your own drum kit or rent one at your own expense. And uh, that was, uh, I saw people like Yamaha were giving like, <laughs> like six or seven drum kits to people. Right. And it's like, well, this doesn't sound right to me. So, so, so when, when Fred and Dinah came back to, uh, and took over Gretsch again, and uh, I ran into them at the, uh, at the, at the NAM show, uh, Dinah asked me what happened. And I told her and she said, oh, I'm so sorry that that happened. Yeah. And then uh, I, you know, uh, I've, I finally got like a little, a little jazz, a little jazz drum kit from them and uh, and at that point i was playing with the heartbreakers full time and 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 uh, and I, I i wanted to play i wanted to play gretch more than anything else i just enjoyed playing the drums they're, they're, they're so easy to play well th- that's for sure and i mean obviously you were in a situation where you didn't need to backline drums uh, i think no. that gretch has done a really good job um over the years of providing backline kits all over the absolutely. world. Absolutely. That's all a, over the, the whole, world. The whole, used to be, the whole story's changed now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know what? Actually, could, we might even have a picture of your first Gretsch kit, but um, I'm curious to hear about it. Look at that. There it yeah. is, your first drum kit. So yeah. is that a round badge or stop sign? That's stop sign. And and uh, and, and uh, I, 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 I had it made that color. It's the only one they had done that color with uh, 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 because I thought, well, you know, with the average white band, I'm this black guy that's surrounded by white people. I thought, you know, it would symbolize, it would symbolize the band. You know, so you got the band on either side, and you got this little black guy in the middle. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> I used to be a lot smaller. Now it would be a wider, <laughs> a wider band of black. Wider band, wider band of black now. <laughs> but they're actually, I mean, I, I, I had them. They're actually being refurbished at the moment they're actually down there wow. fixing them up you trust, they, it, you trust them to do that yeah absolutely okay this is like having an old symbol 
polished. I mean, I, where do you draw the line, Steve? I guess the shell is a shell. So I I'm, have my I'm, symbols polished. My symbols uh, stay polished. <laughs> That is the age old. I remember working at a drum shop um, when I was younger uh, for one of your former drum techs, Steve Rinkoff, ah! who would send me videos of you like this from, from Petty Shows. Right, right, right. My back. <laughs> yeah. That's all I saw. Yeah, it was the best thing. Yeah. It was like, that's groove right there. Uh, anyway, uh, people would bring... Um, symbols into the shop that were vintage symbols and they would have used some t like brass off you know or like <laughs> some terrible oh, no, brasso <laughs> brasso some not a symbol polish at all and they would yeah. just be, uh, be like, oh, we can't take this on trade i'm sorry you know, my my drum my drum tech it, with with eric clapton uh, john collins or collie as he's known he uh, his wife whenever his wife used to show up she would clean my symbols and i'd just walk up to the drum kit and i go your wife's here, isn't she? She, she did a, such a great job of thinking, old Mary Collins. Uh, that's, I guess that's one way to alert your friend about yeah. his wife being in the room. <laughs> um, uh, my first Gretz drum kit was when I was a Ludwig artist. Um, it was one of those drum sets that I acquired uh, on tour, mm. I believe. You know, it's sad to say I've had so many drum sets. When you I say don't... acquired, you stole it? <laughs> Define stole. I got a good deal, all right? No, no, I think actually it came from one of the um, guys that worked at Don Bennett Drum Studio in Bellevue. Yeah. Um, a guy named Jim sold me a round badge turquoise satin. There it is. Um, and yeah. that this pick is uh, from, uh, I used to have a commercial recording studio, and there was 25 drum sets and 50 snare drums because I was crazy and whoever came into the studio, cause I was on tour most of the time, I'd be like, I want you to have access to all my drums. And uh, I wanted to represent the twenties, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, all the way up to the, to the two thousands in terms of era manufacturer, if you wanted a specific vibe. So to represent uh, the sixties, I had that round badge turquoise kit. And sadly I did not spend much time with it. But when I did play the kit, I was like, ooh, shit, I'm in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because I was a Ludwig and Dorsey at the time, and the drums sounded so good, especially in a, in, a, in a room, you know, like a tuned room, like a good studio drum tracking room. Yeah. And uh, once I sold that commercial studio, um, there was a, a number of drum kits that, that I basically I wanted to throw up. When, when we moved from Seattle to where I'm at now, I had to a separate moving truck just for all my drums and i was embarrassed that that i needed my own vehicle just to transport my life part of my life so i, I let a, a bunch of drum kits go but that was officially my first drum kit that was a gretsch one that i bought however the first one that they sent me gretsch sent me was a twilight sparkle um mm -hmm. new broadcaster oh, there that's it is pretty. right there that. and yeah i love that finish um that is from a studio uh, in Santa Monica. You've probably been there on Second Avenue. Um, I thought I had my Do Not Disturb on. Sorry. I it thought they were terrible. introducing a track that I played on. That's cool. Uh, anyway, the new broadcasters sound great. Um, I use USA Customs. I have a, a blue gray Duco. I don't know if there's a picture of the blue, blue gray Duco. I had him do a custom finish. There you go. And this is no, mine. Except mine's green. This guy sat behind my kit and I was like, look, Who is if it? I'm going to file a police report, we need a photo of this guy like now. Absolutely. He so looks, he I, like he's what happens it. right after this is this guy is tackled to the ground and then we found out he worked for Gretsch. I don't know. He looks That's like one of the drive by truckers. <laughs> Keep going. What else can we say about this guy? <laughs> no, uh, those and that that last kit that was that was shown, uh, Gretsch was kind enough to um, match the album covers for the particular record we were we were providing uh, for that album cycle. But between USA Custom and Broadcaster, I, I go back and forth. The Brooklyns are also amazing, but I'm curious for you: is it Broadcaster or I mean, I see the vintage Broadcaster right back there. Yeah. In the corner, uh, behind you. But for that, you, is it that's broadcast the same age or USA? As me. I don't that's, believe it. You, you look way a, younger. 
That's the same age as me. He's 70 years old, that drum kit. Amazing. 1950 Gretsch broadcaster. Yeah. It's in a bit better condition than I am. <laughs> <laughs> really? And it's been, yeah. it's, it's just been beat up. I mean, yeah. I don't know how that happens. I found that um, Steve, Steve Maxwell's place in New York. I played it in New York and I didn't realize until somebody sent me a film of me playing. I said, dang, that's, dumb. that's incredible sound. Well, uh, Andrew Shreve sent me a little video, a phone video of maybe you're not supposed to know this, but playing your drum kit the other day. And yeah, you could hear through just a phone video how good those sound. Yeah, they, they really are spectacular. They got so the the tom don't have any legs. They sit in little cradles, like a little snare drum stand. Really, and, uh, I haven't yeah. seen that mounting. Uh, yeah. I know that I know there's a big difference between the old broadcaster straight legs and the um, uh, the sort of modern floor tom legs. Like mm. that's what I have on this. I have currently my um, setup now. I don't know. Do we have a photo? Are we that prepared? Boom! Sorry, Gretsch, another custom color. This is my green Duco. The two-tone Tom is something that Gretsch did. Uh, do you remember that, Steve? They did that for a little while in the, no. in the late uh, 50s I remember the 60s. Harlequin, like the Harlequin thing. It's a little <laughs> like the Harlequin. I'm being, there's been profanities shouted at me right now. Anyway. Um, uh, do you know, did, did, uh, uh, did, did, you, did you ever hear of Andy Florio? He, used, he was I a drummer. Know, yeah. He used to play with Lawrence Welk, and he had his own TV show. That's his drum kit. Really? And 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 it's and when when uh, you know there was, there was the, those those cradles that the toms sit in, they really let the toms only sit flat, and I couldn't I couldn't figure out how to tilt the thing. So I sent them over to uh, uh, to DW, and uh, and uh, uh, one of their engineers over there just came up with this little thing to put on the end of the of the leg so that I could tilt the tilt the uh oh, tilt the, the whole thing yeah, but he, he so apparently apparently there's a there's a like a, he was trying to he was trying to patent that 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 um uh uh, uh well, that system huh yeah well that's that's the company that can do it um yeah so this is your that is your current setup for home recording is this 50s broadcast yes right? that's the one that i'm using right so, now yeah if you if I'm I'm assuming that that kit stays parked there. So when you go and do yeah. a gig or you or you get uh, hired to go to a session somewhere and playing a record, what do you use? Do you use a USA Custom or do you use? Whatever I got. You have? Uh, with the paint, I got. I got. Oh, you I have got. your own drums, <laughs> cartridge that come out. I know. Do you? Yeah. Use, I, uh, well, I, I got. I use. I got the the. I got a set of broadcaster that I've been using, and and uh, and I got and I have um, uh, newer. Uh, uh, newer broadcasters or older? Yeah, when they first did the reissue. Right. How uh, do you think um, those sound? Well, you know, somebody asked me that question. I, I was out there in I was out they, I was out at out at um uh, out at Gretsch, and they would they had all these people there from um, Sam Ash, all the representatives mm -hmm. from all over the drum representatives from all over the country, and they were showing all the all the all the whole line of drums, and they sort of surprised them by having me go in there and sit down and play each drum kit. So I went there and, and, and I said, you know, I said, uh, uh, you know, play the Gretsch broadcaster. And I said, you know, I, I have a 1950 Gretsch broadcaster in my house at home. And, and uh, one smart ass, of course, said, so how does, the, how does the new Gretsch broadcaster compare to the old Gretsch broadcaster? And I said, no contest, but ask me in about 70 years and we'll be close. <laughs> There is that. But look, I have this theory. I have this theory that, um, uh, you know, the name Greg Keplinger, you know that? Yes. Name? So yes. Greg has, has been a longtime friend. He used to come in. He makes all that funny percussion stuff. He makes great percussion and yeah. uh, he even makes some stainless steel cymbals that are crazy. Yeah. Um, and, he, and great snare drums. That's how he got started. Uh, anyway, Greg would come into a drum shop and he'd say, give me a pair of sticks, kid. And he would take sticks and he would do these like two-handed over the top ferocious cymbal rolls like mm. just as hard as he could until he was dripping with sweat and he'd give me the sticks back and go here you go 20 year workout two minutes and his whole point was that gear needed to be flexed you know it needed yeah. to be played and i think that that's the thing with vintage gear like um jay bellarose uh had i was sitting with him after a 
a show in London at the um what's that hotel near Shepherd's Bush? The Mandarin. Uh anyway, you know you'd been there. Anyway, we're sitting there having a drink late at night, shutting down the bar, and he he br- he brings up the bomber kit that he has, the Slingland bomber that just looks horrible. The finish is cracked. I mean, the thing looks like it's been in a fire, but it sounds incredible. And he said that he found a bomber in mint condition, a Slingland bomber. For people who don't know, that's an old kit with rosewood lugs. Um, and he found a mint condition one from somewhere in the Midwest, and he couldn't wait to get it. Same finish as his, like, number one A kit. Brought it home, set it up, played it, said it sounded like shit because it had never been played. And I have this theory that drums that have been played, cymbals that have been played, especially drums that have been on tour. So the drum kits, all the new Gretsch kits that I've gotten, um, I cannot wait to get them in road cases put them on planes, send them all over the world, get them in hot climates, cold climates, move them all over the atmosphere, resonate them, play them. By the end of that tour or the end of the year or the album cycle, they're totally different drum kits. They do sound amazing. Well, so I know, think it's a very but, valid point. But some, 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 of, some, of these, some of these old drum kits, you know, they, 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 they do sound like shit. I mean, I, I got, the, <laughs> I've got I've got a couple of Slingerland, uh, uh, Slingerland uh, Radio Kings there from the 20s. And they don't, they don't sound good at all, but you stick a microphone on them and they sound incredible. That's, I got a 1937 Ray McKinley, Slingland Radio King, Black Gold Duco. Paint's chipping off. Hmm. It sounds like a box, you know, in the room when you hit it. And then you put it on the kit and you put a mic on it and it's like, <laughs> hmm. there's no modern drum that makes that sound. It is crazy. Yeah. I don't know how they do it. I mean, it's, they're, they're loud and they don't, they, the sound of them, doesn't seem to get in the way of anything. Well, it's just look, a, it's a, they're very present sounding, but they don't they don't get in the way of any of the other instruments. And it, I mean, it's like right. well, it's, that snare drum's really loud, but it doesn't. You can hear everything else. I think everything right. else has its everything else has its place. It's a very pure, very pure sound comes out of old gear that's focused and like yeah, it carves mm. out its space. Um, sound aside, sound is <clears throat> sound is really important to me. Uh, you know, it's. It's what makes a track sound of somebody's voice. The the choices that yeah, I noticed that engineers make. Uh, <laughs> uh, but my my question for you is, I've always considered that sound is definitely comes from the instrument, but it also comes from your hands, comes from your feet, comes from your your it's whole it's body. body. Yeah, exactly. So I you know I, I think that you have a very muscular feel, but you know you also have a very sensitive approach, like wake up time is a great example uh from petty and i'm wondering when you're practicing like you know how much do you think about technique or independence or like i'm sure there was a time in your career when you worked a lot on practicing the facility part of things you know your hands a long time ago Point in case, right? Yeah. Same thing. I I've spent a lot of years really trying to hone technique and independence. And I spent three years practicing every day. I play every day. I play, and when I wasn't playing, I was uh, playing a band every night. I yeah. I, I, I uh, they let me into school as a teacher because I was too old to get into school as a t- as a student. So I had I had, I had <laughs> students, and then I practice, and I just sit there, and just practice, practice, practice for three years. That was it. Uh- <laughs> well what that was a lot. so that was for three years but fast forward to today like what are you practicing today for me i'm i'm just practicing recording and having consistent time so that you know when i sit down and play i'm i, I sound believable committed confident as a player and i mean it's always the truth on as we used to say truth on tape truth on screen whatever so for me i mean i do work on my hands i do work on my feet um i work on bettering technique but for the most part I feel like the biggest investment I can make is just in being a good time player and being relaxed and being consistent. What well, about you? I don't, I mean, you know, I, I don't I, practice. I, no, afraid not. See? Uh, I, I, secret I, folks, secret I, sauce, I, uh, <laughs> step up to the plate, hit the ball. I, don't I tell you it. what, I tell you why I don't like playing. I don't like playing on my own. I really don't like playing on my own. I don't. I sit here. If I sit down and I tap, tip tap for a minute, I'm done. It's like, okay. But what I do enjoy doing is playing with other people. That's Hence, practice. in my studio, I got all these keyboards and guitars 
and all and bass bases and everything, so that when my friends come over, mm. we come out here and we jam. Yeah. And whether they be, you know, a friend of mine brought his kid over the other day. He, he's got a he got a nineteen year old kid who's just suddenly like clicked in with the guitar and and uh, he came he came over came over the other day and and we sat down and played a few songs. He played some cream stuff and everything. And then I called another friend of mine and said, "Hey, listen, I got there's this kid. My friend, he knew he knew knows my friend too. I said, my friend Glenn's kid, Arthur. He's he's playing really good. Do you want to come over and play? So they came over and they made up a little set and we just played it top to bottom. We played for about an hour and a half. And, you know, I want to do it again this weekend. Yes. So I mean, I, I enjoy that more than I do. Well, uh, and sitting and practice, practice, practice. I, and that's the best thing for you. I mean, I, yeah. we're gonna. I think we need to take a couple questions, but I, I want to say one thing about that practice. Um, I've I've done a, a fair amount of teaching, and one of the things I used to do when teaching a little bit uh, larger groups is I'd line up drummers and have them all play. The instruction was play something you love to play, like that you're comfortable playing, whether it's something from your band or an exercise you spend a lot of time on. Just play for. Uh, four bars or eight bars or whatever and we go down the line and obviously you get to the occasional nervous player but it was it was always obvious who played with people the most yeah. you could you could hear music without music you could hear that they were leaving space as players for you know melody and lyric and whatever there was a different type of composition and confidence that came out of that and I think the only way to get that is playing with people as you say like Absolutely. you could be the you could be the best drummer in your in your own world in you your know, basement but this, it doesn't mean a thing if this kid had done nothing but but play but learn that he, he just played on his own he never played with anybody else you know and so i had to do tell him stuff like look, listen when you want to finish look at me <laughs> yeah look at me look at <laughs> me and go that. like this yeah yeah amazing no books yeah. tell you that no um I think we should take some. Uh, you and I could talk about this stuff for months and years. I don't probably. take any questions. But they have to say what kind of sticks do you use? What's you know? Well, I think <laughs> they're going to screen the questions to make sure someone is not saying, "Why aren't your symbols being polished?" By a well, go on then. Okay, my question is: How did you change your playing from the '70s to the '80s? Because I notice that it's different. What, me? Is yeah. that for me? Yeah. That's There's for 10 you, years in there. I know. So obviously your playing style changed. There's 10 Answer years is. in there. I got, I got lazier. <laughs> <laughs> I got lazier. Uh, uh, you know, you mature as a player. Yeah, I, I think you mature. I mean, so I listen... wait a minute. I got to be clear on something. So you get, you mature, as you mature, you get lazier. So I just need yeah, to pass this on to my kids. Them. Don't want to have to work to it that hard. Do you want to work that hard? I don't really want to work that hard. I, I mean, you know, it's. It, I, I don't know. I mean, I listen. I listen to Brian Auger, the Brian Auger of Living Express live at the Whiskey Go Go. I was just like, that's so exciting and youthful, you know. And uh, and uh, oh look, somebody just said uh, one and two gobsmack, huge difference. Yeah, and it's exciting, but. You know, if I play it now, I play it a lot differently. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different, an, a different animal. I think I play it. I'm more relaxed now. So, you, you're lazy. You don't practice. I'm no. not sure what I'm doing talking to you right now. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty energetic. <laughs> I'm pretty energetic when you put me with a band. Yeah, right. You save <laughs> you put it up me with the a band. band. I, I, I had... can wear, I can wear bands out. <laughs> <laughs> I've had him like. <laughs> I have this theory that drummers without practice spaces play better on live stages because they're so hungry by the time they get up there. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I just, enjoy, I, I just really like playing with people. I just don't, I don't like playing with myself. <laughs> that's a, that's a, I like. This is I where like, the lawsuit comes in. Yeah, this is it. Yeah, I like, I like, I like, I like to interact with people. I, I, that's what I get. I get the kick out of playing a song. I don't get to see practicing. I mean, I, I see guys that do that stuff and they're, and they're really great at it. And, and God bless them, you know. But I just don't find it interesting. It's much more interesting to sit down with a problem for a song. How to make that song work? Now, listen. My turn to talk about you. I I, I noticed that you have a way you have a way of doing a slow burn. 
and you have a way of, of building a song without really changing too much about what you're playing, but your intent, your intent is changing. Uh, what song was I thinking about? I think it was on the, on a translantis, um, uh, translanticism, translanticism. That works. Translanticism. Yeah, it has the, the, is that the one that's, do we just sort of play dun, 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 <laughs> yeah. dun, dun. Yeah. I mean that, that, Same that thing. for me, that's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. I love that. You know, it's like the how you make that song grow. That's what I like. I I, I like to do that, and you can't really do that sitting here on your own. You can't. No, yeah, you got to simmer, right? No, yeah. I've, I've always been. Uh, my goal has always been to sound like I can do more, but not do more. Right. Exactly. You know, to, I to mean, be a little more. Yeah. More and more people are asking me to for more fills or more of this and that maybe because i'm getting lazy mature <laughs> you've got yeah that's it you're maturing <laughs> uh, yeah yeah it sounds like we are giving permission to the world to become more lazy in yeah, a sense exactly. look it's all about i think relax and enjoy it yeah no <laughs> i i've always been in like i said I, for me i would rather be able to hear more of the band more of the music more of the melody for for instance what i'm tracking with with death cab I always want to hear, like if we're doing demo work, I want to hear the, you know, everything the singer is saying. And I want to make sure that if I punch a hole anywhere, it's not stepping on his toes or anyone else's performance. No, I never you know, step on melodies. a vocal. Never, no. Never step on a vocal. No, you wouldn't be working as much as you have been if you did that. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, yesterday I, was, I did a session in here last night and, the, and, uh, and the, there was this, uh, I, I played this fill and I just, I just stepped on it. I didn't. I don't even know what the lyric was, but it was. It, I stepped on it, and and it was pretty obvious to me. It's like you know, okay, let me let me. The track was good, but there was this one spot, and it's like, look, like it just punched me in there, and it was just just a question of waiting, a, waiting a, a a beat before I start. Before I did, it needed something to move from one section to the other, but the, I had to watch out where that something started because it trod on the vocal. It just stepped on right on the vocal, and it's like. Leave the hole for that vocal, and then, and then let it have it. It's um, I think it's called musical. Yeah, the drums musicality. are a musical, a musical instrument. Yeah. Drum, drums are a musical instrument. Uh, 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 so many people now play the drums way more than they play the the the, 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 the a song. Yeah, uh, I, and it just annoys the shit out of me when I when I hear somebody just like they're playing a big clatter going on behind it. A song is that no, oh, no. So how much? Uh, we're, we got to wrap up pretty soon, but um, what? Oh, you why? Been, I mean, we don't have to. We can keep talking <laughs> or whatever. So, uh, the is the, that the, Jules? Is that Jules flexing the, a muscle the, again? The authority, yeah. The the woman upstairs is really. We're here now. You can't stop us, Jules. You know, we could see how far <laughs> we could take this with Jules. I can see her laughing right now. She's <laughs> she says she's good she's, for six more hours. Yeah. All right. Sweet. Um. Uh, what have you been, what have you been working on recently? No, I know, actually, I know a few things, but I'm not supposed to say, let's let you tell the world what you've been working on recently. Well, I mean, I've just been playing stuff in my studio. People send me stuff to play on, uh, from, still from all over the world. People still, still like me. I mean, I don't get to travel any much anymore. I guess yeah, here. People's... We've uh, we got the, uh, we got. We've, I've been doing like more of this sort of stuff, like a lot more, a load of interviews lately because of this re-release, this reissue of the Wildflowers um, mm. uh, album, uh, and uh, I've been just been doing lots of that stuff. You know, I, I got, I got a, uh, I got nine grandchildren. They keep me pretty busy. I've been really busy trying not to get this horrible lurgy, as we call it in England. This uh, COVID. I've been busy yeah. trying not to get that. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, that's basically that's about it. Yeah, just doing a bit here and a bit there, keeping busy. Do you, do you think you're working more at home uh, uh, because of this? I, I feel like there's this trend. I've been doing more session work at home remotely um, than I have in, in years for, I think, two reasons. One, I'm not on tour and having to say no to opportunities mm -hmm. and maybe meeting more people, um, producers online. But uh, every week I've been working really consistently and it's been fun and challenging and something to look forward to because it is playing with people, right? F figuring things yeah, out in the song. You know, but 
I mean, it, it's it's horrible to say that this situation of having to be at home and work from home and not travel has brought more opportunities for me, but it, there there is some truth in that. Um, so I'm just wondering, I mean, you're all set up there. You've got great sounds happening in the home studio. You know, you know enough about being in real studios, not that you don't have a real studio, but you've been so many places to work on so many records that you know what it takes to set up shop at home and work for other people, which I think a lot of you know, younger players are really trying to do right now. More and more I see posts of someone doing a home studio build, you know, to get set up, to set up shop so they can work more from home so they don't need to get on a plane. Not to mention budgets are smaller. Well, so. yeah, I'm not, I'm not very, you know, I'm not very, I'm not very, uh, 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 I'm not an engineer. I've never been an engineer. I, I, I work with engineers, but I'm not an engineer. I but don't, you, have you, know. a, you have a really creative way of doing this where you, you mentioned this the other day. You're set up at home. But yeah. you can you can basically have what uh, an engineer in another location take over your screen and Absolutely. broadcast broadcast your mix and you could do the work. So well, he actually, that... he actually he actually he actually downloads downloads the mix on my computer. He, they send it to him. He preps it, sends it to me. We open it up on my computer, and through the miracles of technology, uh, we do something like this as we zoom. And we yep. have to turn that off, and we talk to each other through the. Through the through through my Pro Tools system, there's a delay, of course. Right. Uh, and uh, but he he listens in his time, and I listen in mine. So, yeah. Do you think there are? <coughs> uh, what are the benefits uh, versus the the problems with recording remotely versus being in the same? For me, being in the same room with obviously a band or a producer, or an artist, you get that you know that physical feedback behind the glass. You see when someone's reacting to what you're doing. Um, I miss that a lot because sometimes you, you're working with people and you go off to, you know, you say goodbye on the call or whatever, and you do some work and you're not sure how it's going because you don't have any cheerleaders in the room. And then you send off your mix or whatever, your tracks, and then it comes back and maybe they ask you to do more. Are you finding that you have to um, work differently, <coughs> like mentally work differently at home than if you were in a studio? Uh, no, I, I mean, I got used to, I mean, when, when, when I recorded with Screedy Politi was the first time that I'd ever been in the studio and it was just me. It was just me and it was in a, a, at a power station in New York. It was just me, a click track and, a, and, and like a bit of a, bit of a synthesizer. I had no, I didn't have any idea what the song was and <laughs> I had to, and I, and, 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 uh, it, 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 uh, back then it gave me a headache because everything was the drums was you know i mean first of all they told me that i wasn't hitting the drums loud enough because i could hear the click easy i didn't have any guitars or a bass or anything in there to you know and nothing to climb up about so i was just very sort of cruising and arif martin said you got to hit the drums harder you're not hitting them like you're not hitting them like you usually do and i thought well how am i gonna i said how am i gonna do that is that because there's no band yeah, there was no band. It was just right. just me. And he, uh, you know what he said? <laughs> he said, he said, imagine Clive Davis's face on the drums. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I can, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Clive Davis was a record, was a was a RCA record. Records. Was a, was a, uh, 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 Arista. Arista. Uh, yeah, and right, we, right, right. We, and we we weren't we weren't having a good time at Arista at all with average white band. It's kind of like the end of the band, really. That was like. Yeah, and then he did he start J Records too? I think he started J Records after. That. I got no idea. I, don't, anyway, I have no idea. Let me ask you a question about um, for some advice. What is the number one? If you had one piece of advice for drummers who want to do more session work, uh, be it at home or whatever, out in the world, what's what's the number one thing you don't recommend doing? Playing anything that's unnecessary. Yeah, I, 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 I've given a couple of lessons. Some people have asked me for lessons here, and I thought, well, what do I teach? I mean, I'm going to sit around and teach technique. I'm not going to do that. You know, uh, uh, playing time is basically uh, that's pretty easy to, to to do if you have a problem with it with with lining stuff up. Just count out loud. If you count out loud, everything sort of falls into, you know. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Everything will pop into pop into into place, you know. So uh, I, 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 the reason that I bought started with this all this system, this this 
recording stuff was to, to, to teach recording. And so I had guys come in and I put up a track that somebody sent me and I'd say, well, yeah, this is a day in the life of Steve Ferroni. You get given this song, play it. So they sit there and they sort of look like this, you know, look at, looking at the screen and everything. I said, well, shouldn't you be writing something down? You know, uh, uh, you don't have any, you don't, you don't have any questions. You know, I'm thinking about what drum to use. Uh, and uh, and and then they sit down and play. And, and when you're sitting here on your own and you're playing, and uh, uh, they sort of get this thing where it's like, well, I've got to, I've got to play something to impress. I I, I should play something. I should play something to impress. And then they play some shitty fill in the middle of nowhere that doesn't say anything to the song at all. You know, uh, right. be sensitive. Play for the song. Think of the song. Don't worry. Have have confidence in the groove. Sometimes all it needs is a groove, you know. Um, Schoolboy Crush is just a pocket. It was so hard to do. I mean, we did we did twenty seven takes of that song, yes. and and it just would not happen. And and finally we said, oh, we leave it and we come back tomorrow. So we left it, went off, did our stuff, came back the next day, ran it down, started to play it. And we went in to listen to the first take, and and uh, and and it was like, no, nah, it's just not there. And the engineer was Gene Paul, Les Paul's son. Gene Paul said, "Do you want to hear the run through?" Of course, because it wasn't overthought. Run through was it? Yeah, yeah. I'm hundred percent on board with uh, the mental game and occupation, yeah. and like what's going on up here. Yeah, but it's, it's if you question. get too far into it, it's just you, you, you're, you're not focusing. You're not, you're not inspired at all. And the, which... and and the band, you know, basically one of the other things, like I was saying to you about the way you build a song, uh, the band hangs off of you. The band, the whole band, everybody, uh, whether it be a big band or whether it be a, a, a trio right they hang off of the drummer so you have to play in that band you know you have to you have to be you have to be the the the, the support it's a support a support role you know you have, the object is the 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 object is to make that band sound like it's the best band on the planet right not to make yourself sound like the best not to drummer. make me sound like the drummer no <laughs> yeah no i i think that you do a really great job of finding that extremely balanced line of saying, I'm here, but I'm holding up. Yeah, I'm I, holding, you know, I'm and holding I this love, up. This is, this is what I want you to see, but I'm here. And it's I my love support. playing the drums. You know, oh, I'm you sure you love playing the drums. I love it. There's nothing to like my, it. To my detriment and to your how many marriages? No, sorry, we won't talk about that. <laughs> Um, four no, marriages, look, four divorces, and a lot of hostages. The hostages <laughs> part. We got to be careful. Once again, they're building their legal case as we speak. Uh, they, um, all forgave let me me. Ask, they all forgave me. Let me ask you for another piece of advice without getting too deep for drummers out there. Um, at what point in your career, have you been playing for how many years? I started 50? playing when I was 12, so just um, uh, 68 years. 68 years in the 60 no sorry years, sorry sorry well, it's 58 years sorry. 58 years um was there a low point in your career where uh you felt like maybe you should do something other than play drums or was there never a doubt in your mind was there some gig or some moment or like phase of your life where you're like this is in other words, did it affect your ability? What what was the low point, lowest point that affected your ability to play your job or do your job? Or has there never been that that point in your life? I, I don't think that there was. Ever, I don't think I ever had that. Where what, what I what I did have when I when I was when I was um, when I was twenty one. Uh, I mean, like I say, I I I'd, I'd been in in Europe for for like you know uh, uh, like three years. I've been in Italy for three years, doing nothing but run around and playing in clubs and meeting beautiful Italian girls and Swedish girls and, uh, and English girls, all kinds of girls, uh, a young man sowing, sowing his oats and, uh, and just, having, just having fun. But there came this moment of like, well, I'm either going to do, I knew what it took to be a professional musician and that took some work. And so uh, I, I either had to do that or go and do something else. And I'd met some, I'd met some Americans 
uh, in Rome that were there uh, and they were doing computer computers. They were working and, and that kind of interested me. So I thought about going back home to England and going back to school and learning about learning about computers. When the, this offer this offer came up for me to go to France and be in France, stay in France, uh, and this is with these musicians that have been to school, and I said, "Can I get into that music school, the Conservatoire, Conserv Conservatoire de Nice?" And uh, and uh, and they they said, "Yeah, we can get you in there." And 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 so the decision was made for me, really. Mm. Uh, uh, um, you know, there's been ups and downs, there's difficult times, and when. When the when the when the drum machines came along and everybody was sort of running scared about this that and then, right. I uh, I I spent I spent time just really I take the whole drum kit with me and and I just sort of play along with it and sometimes they say oh well you know that sounds pretty decent so let's mic up the drums and and let him play it but you know I I was inspired at that point you know when it sort of uh, that was a sort of a low point I think for everybody in the drumming world. And then Phil Collins, <laughs> Phil Collins comes out within the uh, not in the uh, yeah. uh, Easy Lover, and I said, "Dang, he doesn't care. He does not care. That's fantastic." And I said, "Dang it, I'm going to do that too. Yep. Change my change my attitude yep. to the whole thing." And, well, but it was a great song too, right? Like, yeah, but he played album. it. He didn't put phase. a drum machine on it. He didn't uh, didn't nope. do any of that. You know, yeah, he played the drums and it just. I think Phil Collins did for the drumming world at at at, at the appropriate time what Eddie Van Halen did for the guitar. World. Yeah, I mean, he's he, Phil continues to be inspirational. That he's still, you know, as 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 unwell as he's been, that he still goes out and sits down yeah. and 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 performs. You know, he's That's he's that sort an of a guy. Amazing story. That's yeah. an amazing book. Yeah. Um, we, I think we do have to wrap a little bit, but we're going to take a few more questions. If, if anyone else out there has been repeatedly asking the same question, Steve, this is for you, fave Tom Petty song to play. And then they're asking what my favorite death cab tune is to play. Well, Steve, what about you? Um, <laughs> do I have to pick yeah. one? <laughs> uh well go from the gut shoot from the hip I okay like. well i love to play you wreck me because me and my kids mm. used to rock out to that when that when when that uh, i love to play you wreck me but uh, uh don't come around here no more is so. but you know i gotta tell you one of my favorite uh tom petty songs is a song that i didn't play uh, and that was uh uh, uh angel you mean you that you didn't record but you get to play live i didn't i didn't record it and i am and, and uh yeah and uh it was Angel Dream, and it was basically they used to play Shaker on it. That was about it. And the, the, what's what's that song? Um, you know, there's a there's a song. Uh, oh, I got to ask you about this. I'll follow you into the dark. <laughs> Another song that I didn't play. <laughs> you know, I sit, I sat there listening to that. I sat and listened to that song, and like, shit, I would have loved to have had a little crack at that. Just a little something, you know, I'd, yeah. I'd, uh, just a bass drum or something. Based on a shaker or something, just some just some color or something. I was like, "Dang, Jason's got to be pissed that they didn't let him play on that song." <laughs> I'm not pissed. Come uh, on, come on, tell the truth. You you want the truth? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you exactly where it was. I was at Longview Farms in Massachusetts. Did you record there? No. Studios no longer. Um. Uh, and we were in this big old, like literally hundred year old barn, and uh, it was everything was woody. I mean, there's horses in the level in between where we slept and where the studio was, out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, snow on the ground, trapped inside, losing our minds for about four weeks um, to record the album Plants, um, which that song is on. And it was one of those run throughs, right? Where I think I think Ben just stepped up to a mic with an acoustic guitar and performed the song as a run through, and you know the other guys, um, Nick and, and Chris and myself were sitting in a control room listening, and it, that was it. It definitely uh, caught no, a moment. It definitely caught a moment. It's just, yeah, it and I mean it's beautiful, amazing lyrics, and you know it's probably the most covered song in our entire catalog. You can find it everywhere, all over YouTube, but. I can't. It would be selfish for me to say uh, you should have let me play on that song because it it says everything it needs to say as it did the second it went down. And I I remember I can vividly put myself in the in the control room looking over at the the other two guys and being like, 
well, that song's done. You know, there are moments where you really have to check your ego and your desire to want to be a part of something just because you play drums, because you're the drummer. Sometimes you you're, you don't need to be the drummer. Like, not every song on every album needs to have percussion. Dude. So, yes, I, I don't even know if there's you a know, version. But you know, Wake Up Time was like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wake, right. up time, wake Up Time was originally Tom, just Tom playing the piano, and he asked yeah. me to play hi-hat just to help keep him in time it's still yeah but uh but uh, i could have uh, i probably could have played shaker but it would have been like me holding him down and the other you know like while i track shaker and arm record myself because uh, you know the song wanted to be what it was and that's that no but, yeah it's a it's a beautiful it's, it's it really does have a, it does it has a thing on its own but like i say and, it's like one of those that, dang i'd like to have played that <laughs> i'd like i'd like no, to have a, go with <laughs> it's a it's a great song. I, my my favorite. It's out. You know, I love to hear that song and watch it go down. But um, my favorite song to play. Um, someone asked me is off of our last record. Thank you for today. Um, not our last last record, the the blue EP, but the it's a song called Sixty and Punk. And there's a true story. Yes, that, I got true that. Story that goes I, I made it. a note about that one. And that that one makes me feel. And that was you know the studio story behind that was classic late at night. Um, I think the producer had gone home. It was just us with the engineer. Uh, I think Ben the singer might've even gone home, but it was like, we, you know, we'd had a, a cocktail or two and we just, we were struggling with how to present this song. Is it a folk? Is it a piano song? Is it a guitar song? Whatever. And I had in the lounge, cause as you know, Steve studios are filled with random gear right there's pockets yeah. of lounge pockets of storage whatever and just because you've got a, a drum room to work in doesn't mean that's where all the drum tracking happens you know this mm. so i went out and was in the lounge and it was dark late at night low lit and i looked at this old bass drum uh and this 24 inch uh, symbol and this old snare drum that someone had dropped off like i'd loaned someone a radio king and they brought it back I was like, all right, <clears throat> yeah, just drop it off at the studio. So that night, the gear was just sitting by the front door. And I uh, wanted to give one mic, a one mic pass. Give me one track, one pass to this particular song. And I wanted to really portray how I felt, which was very lucid and tired. And I wanted to be as far behind the beat as I could on that song. And it was super open and floaty. And it was one of those moments, you know, like we've all, we've been there when, when a song hits and it's like Riviera Paradise, right? From Stevie Ray Vaughan, last song on the record, yeah. the, the story of like how the tape rolled off, you know, the tape mm -hmm. ran out as soon as the, the cymbal decay happened on that song or his guitar decay. 16 Punk, besides coming from a real place, a real story, heartfelt lyrics, real moment, I can vividly imagine, place characters. I think all that went into my, my, you know, came out of my sticks for the single pass that I got. It was a moment. I mean, I get goosebumps you, you thinking know what about I, it. Do you know what I wrote about that song? What? what I, the note, my notes. 16 Punk, love the drum sound and feel on this song. Well... <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I'm super honored to hear you say that, but it's because I loved it. I did my right? homework, you know. I know. I, I didn't just, I, I didn't just I, come I, here. I wasn't unprepared. Well, when you play Love Has Fallen on Me, for, yeah. you know. That was one we'll take, be, too. <laughs> we'll be, it was. You're serious. Yeah. Shaka Khan. Oh, my God. I re so, re put aside a whole day to record that track. He put aside, he put well, aside a whole day, to, and we, we sat down, Richard T., Anthony Jackson. Yep. yep. And we 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 played we played it, and we went and listened to it, and Ari said, uh, mm, "Well, that's good. Well, maybe we should do another one." And Richard T said, "What for?" You need people so like said, that okay. in your life. So then we just sat down and started to jam, and then they, the, the jam that jam that we did became that song, uh, "Some Love" that's on there. So well, <laughs> it's it's total testament to the fact that if you really believe. And you're inspired by a song or a performance that that is going to translate. That's going to come through. Yeah. That's why I think the live experience is something that will never go away. That's why yeah. people go to see live music. That's why we all love to play live still is because you get that one shot. There's no, I mean, I love modern technology and being able to 
apples eat your way through your day till you're done with mm-hmm. satisfied with crea- the creative process. But there's nothing like capturing a moment, a performance, a performance, a moment. Yeah. And I think that the best records in history have been made with a certain amount of limitations. So I, you know, I thank you for picking up on that song because that is something that still to this day live. I mean, I literally we play I'm no that, dummy, you know. I do know we play that song. I actually like physically do this thing where I'm yeah. like swimming and falling off of the drums, and it's don't because I'm find, trying to get into that headspace of the don't amount you of find that so important? That that's so important though the physical ac- the physical aspect of playing the drums, where you're sitting, how you're sitting, your balance. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 you know where you want this to go when you want when you want it to when you want that to feel a certain way. It's, it's that it's that whole thing about if you want to if you want a drum to say to, to do a five stroke roll, if you want it to go, you got to think it. You got to feel it. It has to come. It has to come physically. If you want that, if you want that to bite like that. Or if you want it to be soft, it has to be, and it's and it's all depending on how you're sitting, where you, how you're feeling. You have to really feel what you want the drum to say, and then the drum will do it. It do it all on its own, and these make it easy. I agree. I I mean I. What would C three PO sound like playing the drums versus Chewbacca? <laughs> yeah, you'd have a pretty good damper with Chewbacca. He just pressed his arm on the. Maybe. Um, uh, well, I don't know what movie you want to see. Star Wars, Jules? All right. We need to ask the, the folks upstairs, are, is there more questions? Or um, what? Uh, I mean, because you and I could keep talking forever. One more, it says. One more question. Incoming? I want one more question. No one has a question? Come on. I know, what kind of, I know what kind of underpants Eric Clapton wears. That's my question. <laughs> I've seen him in a dressing room many times. Oh, I, I got, well, you know, you talked about your favorite petty moments. Um, who would you like to play with that you have not recorded with? Who, who inspires you today that's putting out music that you would love to uh, be a part of? Because you're making, I mean, you're, you've worked with all kinds of people, all genres of music. Like, who are you listening to? Who are your grandkids hipping you to that you're, you're like, oh, I would love to I would love to get my hands on a song like that? Yeah, I, I really listen to a lot of old stuff, really. I mean, I kind of go backwards in, the, um, uh, um, in, 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 in what I listen to. I, um, you know, there was a new Art Blakey record came out, so some of previously unreleased stuff that came out the other day. That was fantastic. Probably uh, there's one, a, one takes. There's a, there's a uh, you know, I've never played with Flea, and I've always, mm. I've always, uh, I've always found he's playing really interesting. Uh, 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 I'd like, I'd like to play with him one day. I'd like to do something with him one day. That'll be, that'll well, be. I, think... I, I, I used to say McCoy Tyner, but he, he passed, yeah. he passed away. Uh, I, I played, I played with him once, uh, a live, a live thing. I would love to have done some recording with McCoy Tyner. Um, mm. Yeah, but um, you know, uh, um, heavy voicings. Know. Yeah. Well, uh, we're we were supposed to do this for an hour, and it's an it, we're at an hour and a half, pretty much. So I I think we got to wrap this up. Um, but man, again, I will say thank you for being uh, such a guiding light for me. If ever I'm, if of... ever I'm up there near the Canadian border, I'll I'll <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, put on my snowshoes and hike into you. <laughs> That's right. We we can we can play live. I have uh, plenty of instruments in the room. I'm not afraid to jump on something. There you go. Drums. Uh, well, again, thank you for, um, thank you, Gretsch drums. Uh, thank you, DW. Yeah, thank you for putting this put together. This and uh, Jason, it's really nice meeting you. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really interesting talking to you. I love your playing. I really do. You do a great job well, of, of, uh, of guiding that death cab for cutie. How'd okay. they get that name, anyways? Uh Old no. girlfriend pain in the ass. <laughs> I'm gonna start using that. <laughs> I like that. Maybe we can edit Wikipedia to say that. I had this old girlfriend that was a pain in the ass who drove a cab. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty funny. All yeah. right. We can we'll we'll carry that offline on, the, on that conversation. But uh again, man, thank you, Steve, so much. Everybody should check yeah. Steve out. Everybody should check 
Thanks, what guys. I've done sure. out. Like, Thanks, yeah, if you're not yeah, unaware of this man's catalog, please, please dig deep. Thank you again, and thank you, Jules, and thank you, um, uh, Andrew, for doing this. All right. I think you have we to done? end it. I think I you have, have to, end to end it. it, or Jules has to end it. I don't know. What do we do? What are you going out? I want to thank Fred and Dinah Gretsch. All right. Let's not forget Fred and Dinah. No, because we uh, wouldn't be sitting uh, behind these fine instruments. Uh, yeah, and I want to thank I want to thank all the all the uh, all all of the companies that support us on the road, and and our poor crew, who have to suffer through everything. Uh, my heartbreaker crew, boy. I uh, know I love you, and I know you're going through a difficult time at the moment. We love you. Yeah, wouldn't yeah. be here without our crew. No. All right, Steve. I'll catch you another day, buddy. All right, we're out. Take I care. guess we're out. See you. Bye. Thank you.